Chapter Fifteen of Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. Mrs. Dashwood's visit to Lady Middleton took place the next day, and two of her daughters went with her. But Marianne excused herself from being of the party under some trifling pretext of employment, and her mother, who concluded that a promise had been made by Willoughby the night before of calling on her while they were absent, was perfectly satisfied with her remaining at home. On their returning from the park, they found Willoughby's curricle and servant in waiting at the cottage and Mrs. Dashwood was convinced that her conjecture had been just. So far, it was all as she had foreseen. But on entering the house, she beheld what no foresight had taught her to expect. They were no sooner in the passage, than Mary Ann came hastily out of the parlour, apparently in violent affliction, with her handkerchief at her eyes, and without noticing them, ran upstairs. Surprised and alarmed, they proceeded directly into the room she had just quitted, where they found only Willoughby who was leaning against the mantelpiece with his back towards them. He turned round on their coming in, and his countenance showed that he strongly partook of the emotion which overpowered Mary Anne. "'Is anything the matter with her?' cried Mrs. Dashwood as she entered. "'Is she ill?' "'I hope not,' he replied, trying to look cheerful, and with a forced smile presently added, "'It is I who may rather expect to be ill, for I am now suffering under a very heavy disappointment.' "'Disappointment?' "'Yes for I am unable to keep my engagement with you. Mrs. Smith has this morning exercised the privilege of riches upon a poor dependent cousin, by sending me on business to London. I have just received my dispatches and taken my farewell of Allenham, and by way of exhilaration I am now come to take my farewell of you." "'To London! And are you going this morning?' "'Almost this moment.' "'This is very unfortunate. But Mrs. Smith must be obliged, and her business will not detain you from us long, I hope.' He coloured as he replied, "'You are very kind, but I have no idea of returning to Devonshire immediately. My visits to Mrs. Smith are never repeated within the twelve-month. "'And is Mrs. Smith your only friend? Is Allenham the only house in the neighbourhood to which you would be welcome? For shame, Willoughby! Can you want for an invitation here?' His colour increased, and with his eyes fixed on the ground he only replied, "'You are too good.' Mrs. Dashwood looked at Eleanor with surprise. Eleanor felt equal amazement. For a few moments every one was silent. Mrs. Dashwood first spoke. "'I have only to add, my dear Willoughby, that at Barton Cottage you will always be welcome, for I will not press you to return here immediately, because you only can judge how far that might be pleasing to Mrs. Smith, and on this head I shall be no more disposed to question your judgment than to doubt your inclination.' "'My engagements at present,' replied Willoughby confusedly, "'are of such a nature that I dare not flatter myself—' He stopped. Mrs. Dashwood was too much astonished to speak, and another pause succeeded. This was broken by Willoughby, who said with a faint smile, "'It is folly to linger in this manner. I will not torment myself any longer by remaining among friends whose society it is impossible for me now to enjoy.' He then hastily took leave of them all, and left the room. They saw him step into his carriage, and in a minute it was out of sight. Mrs. Dashwood felt too much for speech, and instantly quitted the parlour to give way in solitude to the concern and alarm which this sudden departure occasioned. Eleanor's uneasiness was at least equal to her mother's. She thought of what had just passed, with anxiety and distrust. Willoughby's behaviour in taking leave of them, his embarrassment and affectation of cheerfulness, and above all his willingness to accept her mother's invitation, a backwardness so unlike a lover, so unlike himself, greatly disturbed her. One moment she feared that no serious design had ever been formed on his side, and the next that some unfortunate quarrel had taken place between him and her sister. The distress in which Mary Anne had quitted the room was such as a serious quarrel could most reasonably account for, though when she considered what Mary Anne's love for him was, a quarrel seemed almost impossible. But whatever might be the particulars of their separation, her sister's affliction was indubitable, and she thought with the tenderest compassion of that violent sorrow which Mary Anne was in all probability not merely giving way to as a relief, but feeding and encouraging as a duty. In about half an hour her mother returned, and though her eyes were red, her countenance was not uncheerful. "'Our dear Willoughby is now some miles from Barton, Eleanor,' said she, as she sat down to work, "'and with how heavy a heart does he travel! It is all very strange, so suddenly to be gone. It seems but the work of a moment. And last night he was with us so happy, so cheerful, so affectionate. 
and now, after only ten minutes' notice, gone too without intending to return. Something more than what he owned to us must have happened. He did not speak, he did not behave like himself. You must have seen the difference as well as I. What can it be? Can they have quarrelled? Why else should he have shown such unwillingness to accept your invitation here? It was not that inclination that he wanted, Eleanor. I could plainly see that. He had not the power of accepting it. I have thought it all over, I assure you, and I can perfectly account for everything that at first seems strange to me as well as to you. Can you, indeed? Yes. I have explained it to myself in the most satisfactory way. But you, Eleanor, who love to doubt where you can, it will not satisfy you, I know. But you shall not talk me out of my trust in it. I am persuaded that Mrs. Smith suspects his regard for Marianne, disapproves of it, perhaps because she has other views for him, and on that account is eager to get him away, and that the business which she sends him off to transact is invented as an excuse to dismiss him. This is what I believe to have happened. He is moreover aware that she does disapprove the connection. He dares not therefore at present confess to her his engagement with Marianne, and he feels himself obliged, from his dependent situation, to give in to her schemes, and absent himself from Devonshire for a while. You will tell me, I know, that this may or may not have happened, but I will listen to no cavil, unless you can point out any other method of understanding the affair as satisfactory as this. And now, Eleanor, what have you to say? Nothing, for you have anticipated my answer. Then you would have told me that it might or might not have happened. Oh, Eleanor, how incomprehensible are your feelings! You had rather take evil upon credit than good. You had rather look out for misery for Marianne, and guilt for poor Willoughby, than an apology for the latter. You are resolved to think him blamable because he took leave of us with less affection than his usual behaviour has shown. And is no allowance to be made for inadvertence, or for spirits depressed by recent disappointment? Are no probabilities to be accepted merely because they are not certainties? Is nothing due to the man whom we have all such reason to love, and no reason in the world to think ill of? To the possibility of motives unanswerable in themselves, though unavoidably secret for a while? And after all, what is it you suspect him of? I can hardly tell myself. But suspicion of something unpleasant is the inevitable consequence of such an alteration as we just witnessed in him. There is great truth, however, in what you have now urged of the allowances which ought to be made for him and it is my wish to be candid in my judgment of everybody. Willoughby may undoubtedly have very sufficient reasons for his conduct, and I will hope that he has. But it would have been more like Willoughby to acknowledge them at once. Secrecy may be advisable, but still I cannot help wondering at its being practised by him. Do not blame him, however, for departing from his character where the deviation is necessary. But you really do admit the justice of what I have said in this defence. I am happy, and he is acquitted." Not entirely. It may be proper to conceal their engagement, if they are engaged, from Mrs. Smith, and if that is the case, it must be highly expedient for Willoughby to be but little in Devonshire at present. But this is no excuse for their concealing it from us. Concealing it from us, my dear child, do you accuse Willoughby and Marianne of concealment? This is strange indeed, when your eyes have been reproaching them every day for incestuousness. I want no proof of their affection, said Eleanor but of their engagement I do. I am perfectly satisfied of both. Yet not a syllable has been said to you on the subject by either of them. I have not wanted syllables where actions have spoken so plainly. Has not his behaviour to Marianne, and to all of us, for at least the last fortnight, declared that he loved and considered her as his future wife, and that he felt for us the attachment of nearest relation? Have we not perfectly understood each other? Has not my consent been daily asked by his looks, his manner, his attentive and affectionate respect? My Eleanor, is it possible to doubt their engagement? How could such a thought occur to you? How is it to be supposed that Willoughby, persuaded as he must be of your sister's love, should leave her, and leave her perhaps for months, without telling her of his affection, that they should part without a mutual exchange of confidence? I confess, replied Eleanor, that every circumstance except one is in favour of their engagement. But that one is the total silence of both on the subject, and with me it almost outweighs every other. How strange this is! You must think wretchedly indeed of Willoughby, if after all that has openly passed between them you can doubt the nature of the terms on which they are together. Has he been acting a part in his behaviour to your sister all this time? 
Do you suppose him really indifferent to her? No, I cannot think that. He must and does love her, I am sure. But with a strange kind of tenderness, if he can leave her with such indifference, such carelessness of the future as you attribute to him. You must remember, my dear mother, that I have never considered this matter as certain. I have had my doubts, I confess, but they are fainter than they were, and they may soon be entirely done away. If we find they correspond, every fear of mine will be removed. A mighty concession, indeed! If you were to see them at the altar, you would suppose they were going to be married, ungracious girl! But I require no such proof. Nothing, in my opinion, has ever passed a justified doubt. No secrecy has been attempted. All has been uniformly open and unreserved. You cannot doubt your sister's wishes. It must be Willoughby, therefore, whom you suspect. But why? Is he not a man of honour and feeling? Has there been any inconsistency on his side to create alarm? Can he be deceitful? I hope not. I believe not," cried Eleanor. I love Willoughby, sincerely love him, and suspicion of his integrity cannot be more painful to yourself than to me. It has been involuntary, and I will not encourage it. I was startled, I confess, by the alteration in his manners this morning. He did not speak like himself, and did not return your kindness with any cordiality. But all this may be explained by such a situation of his affairs as you have supposed. He had just parted from my sister, had seen her leave him in the greatest affliction. And if he felt obliged, from a fear of offending Mrs. Smith, to resist the temptation of returning here soon, and yet aware that by declining your invitation, by saying that he was going away for some time, he should seem to act an ungenerous, a suspicious part by our family, he might well be embarrassed and disturbed. In such a case, a plain and open avowal of his difficulties would have been more to his honour, I think as well as more consistent with his general character. But I will not raise objections against any one's conduct on so illiberal a foundation, as a difference in judgment from myself, or a deviation from what I may think right and consistent." "'You speak very properly. Willoughby certainly does not deserve to be suspected. Though we have not known him long, he is no stranger in this part of the world, and who has ever spoken to his disadvantage? Had he been in a situation to act independently and marry immediately, it might have been odd that he should leave us without acknowledging everything to me at once. But this is not the case. It is an engagement in some respects not prosperously begun, for their marriage must be at a very uncertain distance. And even secrecy, as far as it can be observed, may now be very advisable." They were interrupted by the entrance of Margaret, and Eleanor was then at liberty to think over the representations of her mother, to acknowledge the probability of many, and hope for the justice of all. They saw nothing of Mary Ann till dinner-time, when she entered the room and took her place at the table without saying a word. Her eyes were red and swollen, and it seemed as if her tears were even then restrained with difficulty. She avoided the looks of them all, could neither eat nor speak, and after some time, on her mother's silently pressing her hand with tender compassion, her small degree of fortitude was quite overcome. She burst into tears and left the room. This violent oppression of spirits continued the whole evening. She was without any power, because she was without any desire of command over herself. The slightest mention of anything relative to Willoughby overpowered her in an instant, and though her family were most anxiously attentive to her comfort, it was impossible for them, if they spoke at all, to keep clear of every subject which her feelings connected with him. End of chapter 15